right on this issue. It's just sort of saying like, this has to do with this, 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 big, this big soup of feelings that we all have to figure out. Um, second chapter of the Bible of the Command, Lewis says that you know, there is an arbiter of feelings. There is a, um, uh, an objective way of interacting with the world when it comes to thinking and feeling about value statements, about things that are right and things that are wrong. It doesn't just devolve into a, well, this is how you feel about it. There's actually like uh, a grand tradition of, <laughs> of being a human person and our relationship with our feelings. Does anybody remember what we called that thing? The Tao, that's right. Uh, why are you eating, eating your face? Is this really quiet? Why you a bit? Um, yes, so the Tao. Um, kind of a weird concept that Lewis uses, but it's, it's essentially a discussion of that there is an objective right and wrong, that there are ways of, um, uh, there, there can be a hierarchy of appropriate responses to something beautiful, like a waterfall. Um, there's also um, uh, realms of um, uh, rightness and wrongness when it comes to value judgments. Um, and then, I don't know, I, I kind of have said it probably every time I've been around here, I really encourage you to go to the back of your copy of the publisher of the Because Lewis, just off the top of his head or from his catalog of books that he has, he tries to put together a small little codex of various statements um, from vast different cultures talking about um, these value statements. I'm talking about uh, what is right and what is wrong. Um, um, in other writings that Lewis does, he does talk about that um, there can be improvements on these things. Uh, the one being um, um, there is an ancient prince like Sumerian or Babylonian, which is you should return to others what they have given to you in a negative sense. So if like, someone cuts off your ear, you cut off their ear. Um, it's proportional justice. They do bad thing X, you won't do bad thing 2x, or 3x, or 10x, because then you're going to have like a blood feud forever. Um, and Lewis says, okay, there's, there's something like that, return x for x, but then there's higher things than this, which is um, oh, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And he says, you see, there can be, diff there can be progression in morality. Um, don't do to people what you don't want done. Do to people what you do want done. That's progression. That, that, that is something that is, this one is sort of better and different. Lewis says, you can have differences in cultures and civilizations. You can go back and say, ancient Rome was real primitive when it came to their understanding of mercy, which is probably true. Um, and um, maybe modern day America is real primitive when it comes to some sort of idea of appropriate shame, <laughs> which is probably true, right? Um, so cultures can, can be right and wrong in these things, but Lewis's point is not different cultures are, are better than others. And so like ancient Babylon is better than I don't know, modern Canada or whatever. That's not his point. But his point is, is that until recently, all of these ancient cultures bought into the fact that being a human being meant that you were basically, um, you had a set of givenness to us as humans. And that being a human being meant that there was um, a nature, a human nature. There was a nature of the world, there was a nature of, of, of things growing. There is a human nature that is not something that is um, like blank slated and then the, the human person is completely formed out of, out of nothingness into whatever we want. Uh, but there's a human nature and human beings generally are happy when we understand our natures and, kind of, and conform to them. And we're, and we tend to be miserable when we have a human nature and we fight against it. Um, there's a, um, an old uh, um, proverb, I can't remember who said it, um, but it's a uh, drive nature out with a pitchfork, but she keeps coming back. Um, and, I, and I love that. And that's kind of getting the sense of what this is getting at. Is that there's a, there's a human nature to people. Um, and um, civilizations up until now have understood that we are in it. It's been given to us. It's sort of the default sense of being a human being. And 
there is some kind of transcendent element to this. There is a spiritual part of the human person. And this is, we're not even getting into Christian theology. We're not even getting into, uh, into what we did just the last Sunday on Easter. Um, um, the old, look at any sort of ancient culture, and they have a sense of rightness and wrongness and judgment. And um, if you go down this path, it's going to be bad for everybody. If you go down this path, it's going to be healthy for everybody. Whether or not they are but I'm in those degrees of difference. Okay, so that's, that's chapter two. The chapter three is the chapter that is the one that made Lewis kind of famous. So it's the only chapter, so I remember taking um, undergraduate philosophy classes, and so I had that like, stereotypical cool undergraduate philosophy professor that just loved being on Christianity. I thought it seemed laughable to think about it because it was like absolute stereotype of what you were told when you were a kid. That was him. Um, and even he reluctantly would agree that like, when it came to chapter three of the Apologist of Man, okay, Lewis was kind of on something interesting, but it's not going to shame it's a Christian unless it's like a Satan, blah, blah, blah. And all the students in the front row are like, ah. Um, anyway, um, so chapter three says, says okay, um, uh, there's this sense that these authors of this first book had of trying to, like, um, have that, like, well, everybody knows that this human feeling thing that we're talking about is really just, or this, this human value system that we're talking about is really just us talking about our feelings. Um, and then, uh, uh, I mean, um, um, and uh, what we should do as, uh, as educators is not the initiating a young mind into the game of humanity. It's not like bringing up a, a young heart and soul into this thing of what it means to be a human and all of its depth and all of its mystery and all of its joys and all of its pains and all that kind of stuff. It's, no, we've got this room of kids, and we can kind of, we have this idea of what would be the best way for them to behave in this world, and we are now going to engineer them. Uh, and this was the... Um, uh, this was the, the, the that sort of, um, it, at the end of chapter two, Lewis introduced this idea of the conditioner. As opposed to the teacher, we have the conditioner. Um, and that sounds super sinister, and it probably is super sinister. Um, but uh, Lewis was saying that they're not wicked and bad people. In fact, they're really, really well-intentioned. Looking at the world around them and saying, okay, what are the problems of this world? Uh, the problems of this world are that um, maybe Religious differences are causing war or causing struggle. Okay, so we need to we need to try to like get that out of our kids, or um, the fact that we are not welcoming to the outsider, um, and that uh, so we need to you know make sure that all children realize that every outsider is actually just a friend you haven't met yet, um, and uh, and that and so if you can, and that will sort of right the wrongs as they get older, and whether or not the conditioner is correct or incorrect in their assessment of the rightness and wrongness of the world, the move itself of saying this is a mind that needs to be engineered towards a specific end, Lewis says it's all right from losing his dad. When you do that, you stop treating your student as a human. <laughs> you stop treating your student as part of um, us, as humanity, and you start to treat student as like an object, or you start to treat the student as um, something to be manipulated and something to be engineered. Okay. And then the, the and then Lewis says, okay, so imagine if we like this idea. And we married this idea of the human person is something to be manipulated, the human person is something to be molded for our own ends, however noble they may be. Um, and we can marry that technique with modern technology. And this is where he goes in chapter three. Um, so in chapter three, Lewis, um, uh, Lewis uh, says, um, our relationship with technology goes all the way back to Francis. Um, he may not have ever said it, but he was the person that had knowledge of power be the, um, that sort of, that, he made that phrase kind of popular. He said, our relationship with technology has always been, if you know something, you have power over it. When you have power over it, you can manipulate it. For 
for some kind of end. This is generally a good thing. When we know how like sewage moves, <laughs> we can manipulate it and get it out of our cities and stuff like that. This is a good thing. Uh, I don't think anybody in here is not an anti-technology person because they don't get along. And if you are, uh, you know, good luck to you. Um, if you actually don't want to talk to you, you, you sound cool. Um, but, uh, but he said, but okay, so when you know something and understand something, you can have power over it to manipulate it. This is sort of what technology is. He says, when we start turning this, this uh, potential toward the human person, we can get ourselves into a place where we abolish the end. That's sort of the title of the book. Um, if we have the ability to say, um, uh, what's wrong with people is the way that they think, or the way they behave, or maybe we get to the point where we say, what's wrong with people? Well, they grow up in families. If we can get rid of that, then we'd be a whole lot better. Um, families would mess people up, so the state would do a better job or whatever. Um, uh, Lewis says, if we can take the technique, if we can do learning about human psychology and how to manipulate people's emotions and how to really propagandize people to do what we want, and he's writing in the 1960s, so he only had a small little vision of some kind of idea of genetics, uh, uh, modifications, or, um, or um, he calls it eugenics, which is like an old word for it. Um, uh, and he says, if we ever get to the point where we have the ability to really take the human person in his physical body and his sort of mental capacities and really mess with that source code, really get in there and start to say, okay, what's really, you know, um, the problem with Bianca is that she gets so angry all the time. So what we can do is if we can just get in there and if we can figure out, oh, there's an angry gene, well, let's just get that out of there and then we're going to have a happy dog called Bianca, right? Um, he says, if we have people, well-intentioned people, and we have this period of time in human history where we can do this, um, he says that the people that are going to come after that are not going to be the sort of like glorious race of perfected man. Um, but we are going to have something that is akin to, like, uh, he says, you know, how the eunuch admires uh, the full man. He says, this is what he says that the next generation is going to be. They are going to have um, succumbed to the power of, this, of one generation that says, we know what's wrong with human beings. We know how to make human beings right. Um, and we can use science and technology and the best minds of the day to make this happen. And Lewis says, if, if we get that kind of situation, um, we're, we're going to get into the point where uh, we haven't conquered nature, uh, but nature has conquered us. We've turned man just into material, and then we're weirded out when we just have material response, and we just have machine responses back to us from, from our students or from people. Um, and this, and so, I mean, this is the freaky, uh, this, you know, this uh, rocked my canoe when I was a kid. Um, uh, I don't know if I've gotten my phrase. <laughs> it's a Canadian phrase. Um, right, like this, um, uh, this uh, kind of sense is, is a scary thing. Now, we don't have, like, I don't know, genetic manipulation machines in our classrooms yet in order to uh, uh, help our kids write better or, or, um, or to pay attention. We don't have, like, you know, class participation drones hovering, scanning their, their eyeballs to make sure that they're, that, that they're listening to what we say. Um, uh, so this may not feel like this is a, um, uh, a problem yet, but it is, but that, that, um, that sort of ethos behind it can really easily creep into our, um, to our, 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 the way that we think about students. Um, um, I, I think I when I first started teaching, uh, I remember um, having all these little faces looking at you at the front of the room, you're like, God. Um, and uh, um, realizing, like, uh, thinking, wh what actually is this? Like, like, kid, like, you need to have the right anthropology to be able to understand them. And if, if your view of a human is they are perfectly manipulable in order to reach some sort of desired end, you're going to teach the classroom in a certain way. And if you say they are an eternal soul that is um, one day going to live in eternity uh, somehow, uh, um, uh, you are going to teach a classroom in a different way. Um, um, think of it this 
way. If you knew that your pastor went to seminary, and he, when he got to seminary, he was sitting there all eager in front of a note, row with a little notebook. And the seminary professor said, okay, everybody knows that this whole church Christianity Bible thing is like not real, right? You know, you know you, you, I know this, you know this. It's just a big metaphor. Christ raised from the dead metaphor. You know this, I know this. But it's actually really helpful for your parishioners if they believe certain things about this because it's going to influence their behavior in this world and they're actually going to have happier lives if they, um, if they themselves believe this. Um, but we all know it's not really the real thing. How do you think that church is going to go 25 years from now? It's going to be empty. In fact, this is why uh, uh, a lot of um, these some of the denominations that I grew up in are empty. Uh, I've been to those seminaries. <laughs> I've heard, I've sat in that lecture. Um, right? If we don't have that, um, if we don't sort of ourselves live in um, understanding that we are in this grand tradition of, of objective values, that there are rightness and wrongness, um, and that's a difficult thing to, to struggle to live with because some of these things are in tension. Um, if we ourselves aren't in that, um, but we feel like we're outside that, but we want our kids to be in that, our classrooms aren't going to work. Um, we're going to, these things are going to be, are going to be failures, and our kids are going to sort of see through it because they're really good at that. Um, anyway, I don't want to keep going on chapter three because I do want to keep some time. We go to 8.30, right, which is the three minutes. Oh, 8.40, All right, well, I can blow the eight for another 10 minutes. Um, no, I do want to open it up to questions. Um, um, so that, that, that big scary about um, the, the marriage of technology and arrogance about how to change human beings, I think definitely is a world that we live in right now. Um, uh, uh, gosh, when, uh, I guess, yeah, I started Veritas in 2012, and the, the thought of, like, screens and dopamine not even on the radar, and then 10 years later into teaching, my students are, like, have these, these phrases, and they understand that, like, uh, that we have dopamine responses, and what are you talking about? Like, how do you know this? Um, but uh, you know, we're, we're increasingly becoming aware that the sort of the, the world we live in, um, um, and the tools that we have um, uh, aren't um, aren't just tools, and, and they're not benign. The actual forms of the tools uh, have have a changing effect, um, and, and that's maybe a whole other a whole other conversation, maybe a whole other piece of the story. Um, but I do want to open up to questions uh, uh, about how this can work in our classrooms classrooms or maybe some clarifying things because this is heady stuff um, for a Wednesday, Wednesday, <laughs> Wednesday morning. Uh, it's, a, it's that end of your question. So yes, questions. No, I don't think so. Um, uh, I, th I mean, I think we can trace it. it it's, it's sort of this long line of um, um, wanting to optimize things. Yeah, um, there, my view is that you can go back to the Enlightenment and you can see and you can see parts of this. And the fact that it's called the Enlightenment, I think, is kind of silly. Um, but um, going back and saying, um, you, yeah, you can go back to the uh, even the Enlightenment thinkers and they start to say things like. Well, God's not really, I mean, God may be there, may not be there, but the, um, uh, the effects that, we, that, a, that a God thought has on society are really helpful. You start, you start to see that kind of like the idea of the intellectual removing themselves from the community and observing it. Um, so he, he, Lewis starts to get into that when he starts talking about um, when we sort of divorce the practice of science, and, and and saw ourselves as the, um, um, the sort of the, the outside observer of a thing, um, and as the outside observer, that may be helpful when it comes to I don't know Jane Goodall watching monkeys or whatever. Um, but when we think of ourselves as the outside observer studying humanity, he's like, that's that's probably the beginning of a step that is that is a um, um, like pulling apart of the whole. That makes any sense. Uh, but I don't think there's like one guy that did it and we're all, you know, sort of obedient to that. It's kind of this slow movement away from 
a slow movement away from the from the idea of a holistic human experience, something that can be compartmentalized and observed, mastered, optimized, and then packaged. And that, in that kind of sense is sort of what Lewis is talking about. If that makes sense. Other questions? Yes. No, that was just a thinking hand. All right. Yes. Yep, for sure. Uh, I don't know if I can tell you that. Um, no, I mean, uh, a pendulum, it, it, I don't think it's an eternally spiral black hole. Or, um, I mean, just going back to what Cameron was even talking about. So, the mission hasn't changed. The church's mission hasn't changed. Our mission hasn't changed. God's kingdom isn't going to, like, lose because of this. Um, um, there is, there are periods where you have um, moral decay, moral ascendancy. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I personally, as someone who, who holds that view, that that things that we sort of have these sort of cyclical things, um, whether or not we're sort of living in a time where we're reaping a lot of what was sown, going back 500 years. I mean, that's that's maybe a, um, arrogant for me to say that we're like now living in a time where this is happening. Um, but um, so what I what I personally take comfort in is that, like, like the, the gospel hasn't changed, the church's mission hasn't changed. Uh, what we're doing at this school is still clear as hell, um, and um, uh, we're not going to wake up one one morning and just be like, "I'm going um, to be taken by the church." No, that's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. Um, for sure, yeah, that, that, those are pluses, maybe. Um, but we'll get there. Um, so, um, no, I, it, yeah, I had a thought, and then I'm turning at the stage, it's trapped me, I can't remember what it was. <laughs> yes, question. So, what would be the hardest thing for the Vietnamese to to believe about the Um, there, I, I think that there are, um, for students who feel very much, or whose existence is very much something about, um, optimizing an output, and don't get me wrong, those, those things are very important, uh, um, that there are moments set aside for, um, like, let's union with them. Um, so we used to do morning moments. I love those morning moments uh, back in the day, and that was when we set aside five minutes just to like do something that was uh, nothing. It was not even tests on. They didn't even remember it, um, but it was just a, a, an opportunity for the teacher to say like, "Here's a beautiful thing that I like." Um, and we had, we had a, a structure to it. It wasn't just free form. It wasn't you know, um, um, we didn't have like you know, a new twenty year old jigging and like, "Oh, a Fortnite, let's talk about it." Um, <laughs> Uh, but there was there was structure to it. So there, there's things like that. Sort of, um, if at some way you we can um, remind the student that the whole business of human learning isn't just in service to sort of machine modern life. That if all of those um, somewhat sort of uh, those forces that have existed in modern life that are kind of so soul pressuring, if they all went away, Veritas would still need to happen. We would still need to be doing the teaching that we're doing because those things are goods of the kingdom. So it's, it's us as teachers needing to sort of think, okay, how can I take the, the very real realities of a student that is going to need to have skills to go off in the world, to be able to raise families, to be able to be good members of their church and community, but not just have the classroom be fully in service to that thing. Um, because the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man need to exist at the same time. And um, I'm thinking about how the classroom also is uh, rightly ordering those things. It's a hard thing, but um, even just faculty that's thinking about that, I think it's, it's on the right trail. Mr. Grant, I know the hand.
No. I didn't want to go there. But like, you know. <laughs> Um, I don't, I don't know how I, I don't know how I would speak for Lewis on this. Um, my best guess would be that he would say that there is an authority of men over men that exists within the confines of the Tao. That there is a right way to do it in terms of how um, human being, how we would give up our autonomy to an authority to have an authority over us. So I think of the congregation pastor relationship as being an example of that. And then he would say that there is an authority probably that is sort of outside of this ideal objective values where we have um, kind of like a, uh, like a smiley-faced oligarchy that's, that's saying, hey, how can we manipulate the populace into doing these various ends that we have for some kind of good? So there are two different, it's just, um, I think it's sort of my best take at that is that there's a way of doing it that preserves that whole human interact that whole humanness um because i know a lot of people when they think about this or read about this they're like all right well i'm just going to be by myself in the woods and no one can tell me what to do and i think that's the wrong that's that's the wrong way to, to go about it that's definitely not what um the church is about we, like, that is not what you know we are under, under god's authority so um yeah I, we I, you probably have to flesh out some kind of idea of that of this that objective value of authority. She doesn't do it in the book, but I don't you know, I don't think she does it anywhere. Um, but that's that's a wonderfully large question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, funny. And last one. Thank you, Johnny. All right, thank you. Say Jeff. Hey, originally this uh, spot on the agenda was going to be uh, Jeff Fowler's, uh, but that was actually a deception. It was always going to be mine, uh, <laughs> but uh, we didn't want you to know that. Um, actually, Jeff's not even here. He's not even in Austin, and um, you know that's okay because uh, pretty soon we're going to be uh, getting used to not seeing Jeff around here a lot, and um, and we're good with that because uh, we are uh, in the process of um, identifying a new school head. So. For those of you who don't me, know me uh, without my facial hair, Andy, Andy Crown, I'm putting on my faculty hat and putting on my school board chair hat right now uh, because we do want to give you so some information about um, our research that we've been uh, engaged in. Before I want to uh, 
started, I wanted to invite all the rest of the school board members up to the stage uh, if you want to climb up here with me or stand down here. So if you're out there and you're a school board member, come on up. Um, <coughs> because this isn't really my announcement, this is really a uh, school board's uh, announcement at this point. Uh, stairs over on the left, maybe? Or you can stay down here, you know, whatever you guys want. A <laughs> um, couple people you don't see up here. Sorry, that was not well planned. I didn't know there was a stage production going on, so yeah. A uh, couple people you don't see up here. Uh, there's actually 10 of us. Uh, Jeff and Starla are school board members, and even as they're transitioning out of their administrative roles, they're going to remain on the school board. Um, so even through this transition and even long term as oversight in those roles, they're going to be they're going to be here uh, as part of Veritas for a long time in the future. Um, as I mentioned earlier this year, uh, Jeff and uh, Jeff has been signaling to us as a board for many years that he was ready to begin a new season in life. And um, COVID may have extended that a little bit, but ultimately uh, he was responding to God's calling to to move into a new season. So um, he let us know in October that uh, this was going to be his last year. He got to work immediately, and um, you know we had some big duties to fill. So uh, we wanted to get going on it. And secondly, we had to literally replace 100% of our staff. We have one employee, but still, uh, it, it's a big job. Um, <coughs> so we uh, began by praying, um, and when we prayed, we were praying for a lot of things. Obviously, we were praying um, that God would provide our next uh, head of school. But another one of our consistent prayers was for unity, um, unity for our board, unity for our community. I just want to affirm that through this whole process, I have really seen that prayer answered. Um, you know, as uh, as a board, we have been completely unified in this process. And um, and uh, just because I'm not up here today, um, all ten of us are, are you know, really excited about what we're going to be announcing. Um, so step one, after we prayed, um, we formed a search committee. There were seven of us on that search committee, but really because so many of us wear, you know, different hats at different times, um, I can say <coughs> that there were board members, parents, grandparents, teachers, staff, a coach, dean of the House of Bonhoeffer, uh, probably other roles that I'm forgetting, uh, but lots of lots of different perspectives on that uh, that committee to really kind of inform that search. And um, I wanted to just point out, Monica Scantlin was our committee chair, and she did a great job getting us through that. So, uh, so we got committee step two, uh, we need a plan. Um, so uh, from the get-go, we knew we were really looking for someone special. People like Eric Ross, um, uh, we know we can't just plug anybody into that uh, spot. We know, we like to think we're pretty unique, um, and in reality, we kind of are. Um, <coughs> So, so there's a lot of school leaders out there, um, but we needed a Christian, I mean, not just a Christian, but literally a leader who could guide some Christian principles, who could, you know, uh, step into that role and, and you know, have scriptural uh, principles that they're applying in, in their job. Um, so a bit niche. Um, we needed to have somebody who was passionate about classical education. We're all passionate about it, but we needed our leader to be passionate about it as well. And then furthermore, uh, we had to recognize, um, he, that, that individual had to recognize the God-ordained role of parents to you know, raise their children. And not just partner with parents, but literally collaborate with them in this, in this kind of you know, crazy model that we do here. So niche on niche um, on niche. So, um, in addition, you know, we have been actively working to train up our next generation of leaders internally. And um, so, Starla, for instance, uh, who's up, up here, uh, Starla has even been running our Educational Leadership Institute for the last three years. So, we are, we are training up new leaders uh, actively. So, we knew that it was possible that we might get some internal candidates. Um, and while inter in our internal candidates are obviously going to know our values and, you know, respect those, and be excited about those, um, you know, our quiddity, I guess that's the word. Um, you know, we wanted to be sure that we were seeing the full perspective, the full range of, of candidates in the universe out there for us. You know, we didn't really know who God had for us, and we wanted to be open to the possibility that uh, that, that candidate could come from anywhere. Um, so, uh, so, so we hired uh, Carter Baldwin. Uh, Carter Baldwin is an executive search firm. 
They do national searches across lots of different industries. They have an educational arm. They do K-12 searches. They do college uh, searches. Um, Chris Hornsby leads the K-12 group, um, and he works with the search committee to execute the search. Um, he was actually the guy who I just quoted in saying, you guys are niche on niche on niche. So he knew he was uh, you know, in for a challenge, but man, they did a great job. Um, they executed a really fantastic search. Uh, Chris actually made a video for us, and we're going to show it here in a minute to describe the process a bit more. But I'm going to fast forward to the end of, the, uh, end of this. And um, the committee spent about four months working with Carter Bowen. Um, and just before spring break, the entire board interviewed um, our three finalists in the process. And um, after that, we quickly and unanimously agreed that we had a clear favorite and someone who was ready to lead Veritas for uh, many, many, many years. Yeah, even longer than Jeff. So we're excited about that. <laughs> um, so today, I am excited to announce that the head of school for Veritas Academy is our very own Cameron Cook. All right, let me, let me just kind of generally explain uh, what, what Chris is saying. Uh, I think we're going to post this video for the entire community so you can, you can watch it later. Um, Chris wanted you guys to know that you know, their part of the search process is to recruit candidates. Um, they, they talk to over 110, 115 candidates in, in this process, uh, inviting them to apply. Um, we had 14 uh, candidates submit full applications, and from that, the, the committee whittled it down to six. We got more information from them. serving Christian schools of various shapes and sizes. And what you all have at Veritas Academy in Austin, Texas, is truly special. Christian, classical, collaborative. You know, the search work I do is a personal calling for me. And I know your decision to work in a school that has such a unique mission and vision is also a calling to you. So please keep up the great work that you're doing here. When the board engaged Carter Baldwin to execute this national head of school search for Veritas, Martin created a research strategy that identified prospects from the Pacific Northwest all the way to the Atlantic seaboard and pretty much everywhere in between. We evaluated and had conversations with 115 prospective candidates to share the head of school opportunity and invited those who were qualified to prayerfully consider their application. Fourteen leaders submitted application materials consisting of a resume, a letter of interest, and a philosophy of education. I personally interviewed seven semifinalists, and the search committee chose four finalists that the board interviewed face-to-face. -face. Out of that set of candidates, one finalist separated himself as the clear choice to follow Jeff Fowler as your new head, and that finalist was your own Cameron Cook, who received a unanimous vote from the board. You know, from time to time, the Lord will direct a board to conduct a national search, and that is needed to compare a highly competent internal candidate with other leaders from around the country. In this particular case, I am in 100% agreement with the selection of Cameron Cook to take the baton from Mr. Fowler, and I'm excited. 
expectant of the work our Father will accomplish through Cameron's hands in the years to come. Thank you for allowing me the privilege of getting to know some of you and to be a part of this special moment in the life of Veritas Academy. Personally, this is uh, Kayla, his wife, and um, <laughs> you know, they've, they've actually been part of our, our family here in our community for uh, a number of years. Uh, they truly love and appreciate what we're about. They came to Veritas uh, three years ago as parents, um, and they've got two kids in uh, the grammar school right now. Elliot's in first grade, Audrey is in pre-K, and they're doing their part to keep our pipeline full. Anna's two and a half, and they're expecting... Uh, they're fourth in uh, the fall, yeah. So, so Cameron is wrapping up his first year as our chief business officer and has been doing amazing work in the world. To say that he has made a name for himself uh, is probably an understatement. Even throughout the search process, the, this limited time in the search process, um, you know, Cameron has really shown himself uh, in new ways and has really affirmed to the committee that, that you know, he is an uh, excellent choice for, for this place. And uh, he's got deep educational roots. His parents were both teachers uh, at Liberty Christian School in uh, Argyle, Texas. He attended high school there. I think his dad was his math teacher, yes, Bible teacher, yeah. So, and his dad eventually became the head of school there. So, you know, maybe this is in his genes. Um, so we're excited about that. Uh, attended A&M undergrad and earned a master's in curriculum and institution instruction, master in curriculum and instruction from the University of Colorado in Denver. He's got five years of classroom teaching experience uh, from uh, in Colorado, Bolivia, and finally in Austin. And from there, he became the launch principal of Idea Health Profession School uh, in East Austin, where he worked for a year and a half to put together a plan, recruit staff, and launch this new school. Uh, and then he got started there for three years for, as their principal, um, ultimately having 600 students and over 90 staff. So uh, he is well equipped to lead. Um, and I haven't said anything about his character, which, by the way, is awesome. Uh, from what I've seen over the past year, this is a, a really godly man, um, really well-equipped to lead. And um, I'm literally every time I walk into his office, he's got an open Bible on his desk. So um, I know that he is going to be leading from a, a wealth of scriptural uh, wisdom. So very excited to launch him into uh, this next season of their life and our life at the school. So I um, wanted to give you an opportunity to just – are we late? <laughs> Yes, yes, there we go. Um, thank you, Andy. Um, well, I, I always don't even uh, know what to say because um, uh, that welcoming and so awesome. Thank you. Um, the, the thing that, that pops into my mind um, is Jeremiah um, 29, 11, that, you know, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans for a hope and a future. And I think that's been the story for Veritas since the very beginning. Um, you know, you look back to the four founding families and the calling that they had and the faithfulness. And I am just amazed as I hear the story over and over again about how God has led Veritas, how he has brought people here to serve, to serve their families, to serve each other, to do what we do here in our Christian classical collaborative education. Um, that's what God has been doing. And he's been doing it with many of you. This is a staff that has experienced. I, I, I've worked in a lot of schools, and I've never been in a staff where there's so many people that have served here for so long, these five years, the 10 years, and even the founders for 18 years. Um, and so I am just humbled and so gracious to be a part of this team. I have loved it. You guys have welcomed me so well. I tell Kayla all the time about their receptiveness, and um, I don't know why they're asking me for advice because they've been doing this for so long, um, and I'm just, just so proud to be a part of this team. Um, I also, you know, I think about God works in mysterious and wonderful ways. Um, you know, I did not think that this was going to be what I was doing. Um, a year ago when I started to talk to Veritas, I told Troy and I told Jeff that I just want to serve Veritas with every capacity that they needed. Um, and then I, like many of you and Jeff, announced his retirement. 
uh, went into his office and said, Jeff, I'm not ready for this. And I don't know if I like this. Um, and he looked at me and he said, well, Cameron, you need to start praying for the next head of school. And I said, okay. Um, they need to be good. And he's like, you pray that they will be good. I said, okay. Um, and that's what I did. And I don't know what part in the process that praying for that head of school, all of a sudden I was like, oh, my gosh, um, this might potentially be me. Um, and I think in the process, the, the board, uh, you know, Jeff has allowed me and the board has allowed me to attend a lot of their meetings. I've gotten to work with them very closely, and that gives me a lot of peace and comfort, particularly as a young leader, to come in um, with a team that is so supportive that I believe in, that I've gotten to watch, um, and I've gotten to interact with. I see how they make decisions. I see how they support Jeff. I've seen how they uh, have done the transition, and that just gives me a lot of peace and confidence that I'm coming into a team um, that is very strong, that is very supportive, and honestly, through the process, has really been affirming me. Um, and so I'm, I'm very thankful for that. And then I think the last thing uh, that I want to say is that um, we're, we're in a really good spot for us. Um, I uh, have been so impressed with this year. Um, I got to help do a step back for our school heads and deans yesterday. Um, and we talked about our vision for instruction and class notification and what it means. And we wrote it all down on some big chart paper. And then we kind of did an evaluation. And it was amazing to see that so many of the things that we aspire to be our quidditch is what makes us unique come to life and we see it all around our building and our kids and in our staff and we are in a really, really, really sweet spot. I'm so thankful for that. And I know that there will be hardship. There always is. And even hearing uh, Graham talk today that, you know, I was thinking maybe the threat is not so much what could happen internally, but what externally is going to happen and how we're going to handle that in our future. But I do know that the same God that has been here since the very beginning, um, who put that calling on those four found families and so many of you who are still here, that God is still going to take care of us, he's going to serve us, he's going to have his plans to prosper us, not to harm us, and we have a great hope and future together. So, thank you. So, we're going to provide an opportunity to get to meet Cameron a little bit more next Wednesday. There's a 8 to 9 slot and a 3 to 4 slot uh, out on the cafe patio. Uh, Cameron will be there, and you can just uh, come down with him. Um, I've asked Molly, our uh, co committee chair for uh, head of school uh, support, to come and close us in prayer, uh, both for Kayla and Cameron. Good morning. Um, our committee, the head of school support and evaluation committee, exists not only to provide evaluation for our heads, but constant prayer and support. I just know you all want to join with me right now joyfully because we're just going to start everything in prayer This from this exact moment. that We all know together we can join in prayer for Cameron and Kayla. So um, Psalm 16, there's a line that says, The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. That is just on my heart. The lines have fallen in pleasant places for us. Amen to that um, with Starla and Jeff and now with Cameron and Kayla. And we're just blessed. I just praise God. Let's see if I can get through this prayer. <laughs> oh, my word. God is so good. Join me in prayer. Lord, we praise you. We're joyful. You just carry us in your hands from the very beginning to this point. You are so good. My, my emotion and tears are happy and joyful. And I just... Thank you so much for this opportunity that we have before us. We just are so grateful for you and how you started everything with Starla and Jeff. And thank you so much for the beauty that comes when believers support and believe in each other and pass batons in ways that are beautiful and are just a continuation of the beautiful work that you do. Lord God, we just come together in unity today here with Cameron and his wife, and we're just so thankful. I just pray that you would knit us together continually, that we just are the most beautiful tapestry showing your glory in everything that we do, Lord. You authored this all you knew before it even started, and thank you for just bringing Cameron to us and bringing this opportunity to just spread your word to these students, Lord. Lord, we just pray for Cameron and all he has before him. 
we love you, we trust you, and just um, go with us, go with Cameron, be there for his uh, whole family, all the kiddos, and um, we just rejoice today. Let this be a day of rejoicing, support, and we just honor and bless your name, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're late for morning arrival.